All right, let's see here. What is the number? Thank you for calling the Reno Pepper Mill. This is Cheryl. How may I direct your call? Uh, I'm just trying to find out what time the casino opens today. The casino? Exactly. The casino is 24 hours. No kidding. And if I want to uh, buy more chips after I lose the chips I have, how many times am I allowed to do that on a given day? Let me get you over to somebody who can answer that question for you. One moment. <laughs> Just try and play all day. Open 24 hours, who knew? Uh, in all seriousness, I bet all of you guys have been in a poker game where people get into a debate about who's played the longest session. And I find it, it's a point of pride amongst poker players to always say, oh yeah, I once played for 48 hours straight. Like, every poker player you talk to will say something along those lines. Yeah, once I did three straight days. It's unbelievable to me. The longest session I've ever played was 16 hours. And I vowed to never do that again, and I haven't. I just always subscribe to the theory that I'm never going to be playing as well at the end of these long sessions. So, why do it? The casinos always open the next day. Hey, I want to mention, if you're looking to play when you're on the go, check out the High Society Club on Poker Bros. I can guarantee you it is the most trustworthy club you're gonna find on any agent app. If you wanna go through my link in the description below and use my referral code, you can jump in there and enjoy the action today. High Society on Poker Bros. As for today though, it's live poker here at the Pepper Mill. Let's go jump in to a 0-5-10 game. I would show up at Pepper Mill just after 11 a.m. And that was the problem on this day. There's a lot of times where you need to get there before 11 a.m. to get a seat, and this was one of those. So I found myself in what I call poker purgatory. Third on the list. The worst possible place to be. You want to be first or you want to be eighth. Otherwise, you've got a long wait. As I would wait, I would notice that in the main game on table one, they had bomb pots being played. And I also noticed that at NorCal Poker is on the same page as me about bomb pots, saying, I love the idea of them. Action players love them too, but then they go bust, which is why I hate them. Could not agree more with that sentiment. We finally fire up the second game on table five, featuring a guy who I recently ran into on the other side of the world. Garland from San Francisco is here. Now, where, where did I find you? At the foothills of Mount Fuji? Uh, yeah. I was convinced that when we were out there, Fuji was going off. By the way, Garland is also a subscriber of Crush Live Poker, which will explain a hand that he played against me that you'll see coming up when I was dealt pocket aces. Anyway, I win several small pots early on in this game, but none of them would net me more than $30 at a time. I would have the rock four times in the first half hour of play, and in exactly half of those instances, I'd pick up eight deuce. Because in the straddle, 38% of the time, you get dealt eight deuce. Every time. That doesn't make sense. Over the first hour, the same player won every pot of significance, and it became something that every single player in the game knew would happen after that occurred within that hour, and that's that he would hit and run. So, sure enough, that took place. We get a hand where the hijack would raise a 30, and I'd call in the cutoff with ace-jack offsuit. It was 75 in, the board would come out ace-queen-10 rainbow. Hijack bets 40 here, and obviously I'm not going anywhere. So the 155 in, the turn would pair the queen, and the hijack checks. My $50 bet, I was hoping obviously would get a little action, but it results in a quick fold, but at least got me on the scoreboard in what, at that time, two hours into the session, was the biggest pot that I had won. The game is still five-handed, and it's playing tight. I have aces in the cutoff, and I make it 25, and the button, three bets to 80. I four bet to 175 here. Button thinks about it before finally making the call. 
Now with 360 in, the flop is 10, 8 deuce, 2 clubs. I bet 150. He thinks about it for a second before showing pocket queens and laying them down. When you run into CLP subscribers like this guy Garland, they're tough to get money out of. Okay, so we had Cinderman, who's got an avatar of Nick Bosa, so I like him already. Okay, so at this point, I think you skip Kayla's corner just so we can complain and you show her and laugh. Mm, there's no skin off my nose. It's only the viewers who are wanting. I look up to find Logan Webb on the mound, kicking off Giants baseball for the season, and would look down to find the player on my right and making it 30. I have Jack-9 in the rock and defend $20 more from the hijack, with the cutoff coming in as well. Now with 95 in, the flop is King Jack-9, two diamonds, giving me bottom two pair. Under the gun bets out for 50 here, and I raise 3x. Cutoff folds, and under the gun, though, doesn't waste any time completing. So with 395 in, we go heads up to a turn, which would come the four of spades, and he checks. I was certainly hoping that he would at least think about this for some time, but that didn't happen, leading me to believe that he probably didn't have either of those two aforementioned hands as he snap folds in this spot. This is a mid-session update. You may remember, I gave snowboarding a shot a couple of years ago. I subsequently retired from snowboarding after breaking my wrist, which apparently will never be the same. Now, about 60% of the reason I did that was to try and have something to do should I meet women who also snowboard. Fast forward a couple years, a year ago I meet my girlfriend Anna after I'd already retired from snowboarding. Well, she's a huge snowboarder. So I'm in this delicate spot. I have no desire to try snowboarding again. Clearly, starting it at 37 years old wasn't the ideal scenario. So partially because I want something to do with Anna and partially because it's a fun thing just to do by myself, I'm jumping back into skiing for the first time in 31 years. And I want you all to know that if I break something when I try this tomorrow, I'm gonna be on tilt. <laughs> I get dealt pocket jacks under the gun and make it 40 over the rock who is in the big blind. Cutoff calls behind and the straddle completes. So with 120 in, the flop comes out 9, deuce 3, 2 spades. Big blind checks, and I bet 80. Cutoff folds and the first guy check calls. So with 280 in, the turn is the queen of hearts. He checks again and hoping to keep all of his nines in there, I bet 100. He doesn't take all that long with it, and makes the call. So with 480 in, the river is the four of clubs, and he checks the third time here. I make a semi-thin bet here, not overly thin. I just bet 110, hoping that he will call me with a nine. And he does announce, albeit he didn't show, announcing that he has a nine, but came to the conclusion that was the correct conclusion, that I was not bluffing, and decided to muck. I then lose back $130 to that same player when I flopped top pair, but would ultimately lay it down when the board went runner-runner to a four-card heart flush, and I didn't hold a single heart. We then get an aces versus kings cooler, won by James, the actual professor, with both players flopping sets on one board, and both players making really big flushes on the other board, and aces victorious in both. After that, I'd win two more small pots that would take me to this hand, which would come against the man who just won that big cooler, and it resulted in me doing something I'm not all that happy about. I pick up ace-king of clubs under the gun and make it 35. I actually didn't think I was going to get much action here, but ended up getting three callers as the game was starting to pick up right around the time I was going to have to get out of there to go pick up my son. And with 140 in, the board would come out king 10 six, two spades with one diamond. I bet a black chip here, and James, the professor, is my only caller. He's in the cutoff in this spot. So with 340 in, the turn is the ace of diamonds, giving me top two pair. 
I make it 200. And sure enough, he doesn't take all that long before making the call. And with 740 in, the river is the Four of Diamonds, and this is where I'd proceed to make the mistake. My thought process at the time was if he missed spades to let him represent diamonds. And if he has diamonds, well, in this case, he's probably just going to get paid off. But generally speaking, in pots like this, that get this big, people don't bluff nearly as much. Now, this player is not exactly known for his passivity, but I still should have factored that part of it in. Especially when hands like Ace-King get there. And that's obviously what I have, and obviously has gotten there in this spot. I should have just bet another 300 or 350 or so in this spot, and if he went all in, I was going to have to consider what to do at that point. But I decided to check, expecting him to bet a lot of the time, but in this case, he just snap-checked it back, and my mistake cost me value, but it was still a nice pot to wind down the session that would come to an end. the session, booking a win of $1,010. I could say more about it, but I'm not going to because, well, it's too damn windy. All right, back here on a snowy late March weekend here in Reno, Nevada. Shout out to local fave Dave B for the idea for the bit at the beginning of the vlog, and shout out to some guys at Peppermill for a ridiculous Friday night worth of action. As you know, as I've mentioned, I don't play late at night much at all anymore. My life does not allow for it too often, but on this particular Friday night, it did allow for that to take place. There was a $2 blind game that looked so good that I had to get into it while waiting for 510. And oddly enough, we managed to successfully turn it into a 0-3 blind with a $5 winner straddle. That's kind of the Goldilocks middle game that they can never really get going. And because of the particular lineup in what had been a $2 game, we were able to convert it into one. All of a sudden, there were two of them and a list. It was really all because Reina came over and asked me if she thought we could do this. And I said yes. And then two other guys heard that and agreed. And we made it happen. It was pretty funny. So I don't know if that game is going to actually become a fixture at Peppermill or not, but there's a chance that it might if 1-2 is not big enough and 5 is too big, that might give you uh, a game to play in. And that's what I would play in on this particular Friday night when an unforgettable hand of poker would take place. One that old school Deech Vlog viewers will get a kick out of. It comes when we get a guy who had already been all in three times and busted out all three, the most recent of which had come when he just shipped 500 into the middle with 6-9 offsuit over a raise pre-flop and had to rebuy. So that's kind of all you need to know about some of the play we were seeing in this particular game. We get a hand where under the gun opens to 20 and MP1 makes the call. The guy that I'm talking about here was in the cutoff with the rock, in this case, the $5 straddle, and he calls the 15 more. I'm on the button with kings and make it 125. To nobody's surprise, all three of these guys make the call. And with 500 in the pot, the flop would come out 7-3-3 rainbow, and it gets checked to me. I bet 200 here, given the fact that so many of these guys' hands have just completely missed. I want to try to keep guys in there if they manage to have hands like ace-seven suited, pocket eight, something around there. Folds to the cutoff who check raises all in for his last 315 more. As we have already seen on this night, he is jamming super wide in this game. So folding any overpair here, I feel should be punishable by incarceration in the state penitentiary located in the small town of Ely, Nevada. So obviously, I am making the call. So we have $1,530 in this pot. The one thing that he did do in this hand that I appreciate is immediately show his cards in an all-in situation, which is the way I feel it should always be done. But the thing that I didn't appreciate was what his cards actually were, matching the score of Giants Padres on that same night. He showed up here with the fucking Octocrab! <laughs> 
Haven't gotten to play that particular sounder in quite a while. One thing you'll often hear said about places like Vegas and LA is the second biggest game in the room is often the best game. And while, again, I don't know this game's going to go too often or whatever the case is going to be, that was the case on this night. The second best game was the juiciest because guys are calling $125 before the flop with 8-3 offsuit. In this case, the Octo Crab just happened to sting me in a spot where it definitely hurt. And to make matters worse, I didn't flop the nut straight against that same opponent uh, like 10 minutes later, and he jams all in again. And I had the absolute nuts. This time he had a legitimate hand, though. He had a set, board paired. He beats me again. So I turn a win into a loss, booking about a $500 loss on the evening in a 0-3 game on a rare step down on this Friday night at Peppermill. Hit those like and subscribe buttons if you're new to this channel. If you like cash game action, this is the place to come. Follow along on Instagram at Ben Deach. And we'll see you back here next time. But I know it's not true I wanna put up all my walls Cause I'm not in the mood But then I cut myself off From the rest of the room I know that time can heal it all If you're patient and soon It can all be worth it All the searching